Hello, children. Welcome back. Today is uh, the last day to talk about Chapter 2. We're going to be doing Section 4, which talks about chemical reactions and enzymes. By the end of this lesson, you should know these three objectives, and you should be able to define all these key terms. All right, so let's start talking about chemical reactions. Now, a chemical reaction is any process that changes or transforms one set of chemicals into another, by changing the chemical bonds. Okay, so it's really important that we remember the bonds are what is getting changed in a chemical reaction. Um, and we could have lots of different types of reactions. Okay, we could have ones that let out a lot of energy. Um, we could have ones that totally change something new. This here is sulfuric acid and water. And you see it makes this new, really ugly black substance. Um, it's letting out energy, letting out heat and water uh, through smoke here. Okay, but a chemical reaction is anything that changes either one atom or element or compound into another by rearranging those chemical bonds. In a chemical reaction, we start with our reactants. Okay, so the two things we start with are the reactants, and we end up with the products or two things that are new. All right, now when we have a chemical reaction, they're usually written like this. We have two products. So let's say we have sodium hydroxide or NaOH which is a base. Let's say we had an acid like hydrochloric acid or HCl. We then draw an arrow which means we have a chemical reaction. All right so this chemical or this arrow sorry is a chemical reaction and we're going to get two new compounds. We're no longer going to have sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. We are going to get NaCl which is salt and we're going to get H2O. All right, so in this chemical reaction right here, right, we see we start with two reactants, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. We have a chemical reaction that happens here, and we get two new products. So whenever you see an arrow, you know it's a chemical reaction. All right, uh, now chemical reactions are very important uh, for us in biology because it's all about energy changes. And as we know, um, Life needs energy. We need energy to survive. Okay, so this is really one of the most important things to take here is that chemical bonds, so the bonds between atoms to create a compound, represent energy. So chemical bonds are made of energy. It takes energy to make bonds, uh, and when we break bonds, we release energy. Okay, and a great way of thinking about that is, is how we have life on Earth, right? There's two forms of chemical bonds and energy that we use in life. The first one is plants do a process called photosynthesis. Okay, so plants do photosynthesis. They use the energy from the sun, okay, and they take that energy and make chemical bonds in the form of sugar. Right, so again, those chemical bonds are energy. In photosynthesis, we go from sun energy to sugar, okay. And the other process we talk about is cell respiration, okay, and in cell respiration, things like animals, we do it, right? Plants do it. We take food energy that plants make, so like this yummy, yummy cheeseburger, all right? And we take that food energy, we eat it, we break it down into nutrients, where we use our muscles and we use brain, we use that energy in us, all right? So the other one is cell respiration, where we take food energy and we break those bonds uh, into useful cellular energy, okay? Um, that's also the process called metabolism. So aside from knowing that chemical bonds contain energy, and when we break those bonds, we release energy, we have to put energy in to make new bonds, um, it's important to know that chemical reactions that release energy are usually occur on their own, right? If you light a piece of wood on fire or a stack of homework on fire, those papers are going to eventually catch fire and go out of control, right? That energy is going to go on its own. Um, sometimes chemical reactions have to absorb energy, okay? Um, and they're not going to occur unless we give it that energy. So photosynthesis, like right, plants are not going to make sugar if you hide them in a closet. They're going to die because they won't have sun. They can't do photosynthesis. So again, usually chemical reactions that release energy will do the reaction on their own, whereas chemical reactions that absorb energy, they need a source of energy, so like plants and the sun. And this kind of brings us to our first key term called activation energy. Okay, and the energy activation energy is the energy that's needed to get 
a reaction started, right? And we can think about this because it's got the word activate in it, which means to start, okay? Um, so all reactions have some sort of activation energy or energy that we have to put in to get it started. Um, we can think about activation energy of, again, if we go back to lighting your homework on fire, right? It's not going to spontaneously combust. What we need to do is we need to get a match or a lighter, hopefully a match that works, and we're going you know, to give it a little bit of energy by lighting it with a match, and that's going to start. Eventually, it will do it on its own, right? We don't need to have a match there the whole time. So all types of reactions are going to have some sort of activation energy or energy to get it started. We have basically two types of reactions that we're going to talk about. The first one is energy absorbing reactions or endothermic. Okay, so endothermic reactions absorb energy. And we have energy releasing or exothermic reactions. Okay, exothermic release, endothermic uh, take in energy. Right, the prefix endo, we think about going in, and exo, right, like an exit, we think about energy going out. Now, if you notice down here, these two graphs, right, we'll start with endothermic first. We have energy on the y axis and time or the course of reaction on the y. And if you notice, right, we start down here, our reactants have a certain amount of energy stored in their bonds. So that energy is stored there. Um, and then products have a certain amount of energy, okay? And if you notice, in an endothermic reaction, or an, a reaction is going to take in energy, the products are higher than the reactants, right? This means that the products have more energy than the reactants, right? We're going to take energy, put it into the products. So the products have more energy than the reactants, which is different than exothermic, where energy gets put out, right? If we notice here, the reactants are higher up on the graph, so they have more energy than the products, okay? An example of this, would of an exothermic, would again be lighting your homework on fire. Paper has a certain amount of energy, but it's kind of just sitting there, right? After we let out, we light it on fire, it lets out all this heat, right? So we have to put a little bit of energy in there to get it started, match, and it lets out all this heat. The ashes of your paper um, let out have much less energy than the actual paper, okay? Again, so a great way to think about exothermic reactions or energy going out is we start with our reactants and we do the chemical reaction and we get products plus heat or energy, usually heat, but heat or energy are released, okay? Exothermic energy goes out. All right, so now we get to this thing called enzymes. And enzymes are catalysts, okay? And catalysts are substances that speed up the rate of a reaction, okay? So a catalyst is any substance that speeds up the rate of a reaction. In biology, we're going to talk about enzymes, right? Enzymes are specifically catalysts in our bodies that make chemical reactions go faster. And the way that enzymes or catalysts works is they lower, okay, a reaction's activation energy. Again, activation energy is the amount of energy needs to be started. So an enzyme works by taking the amount of energy that we have to start it with and makes it lower. Uh, I really like this graph to explain it. Again, we see energy on the y-axis and time on the x. Um, now if you notice, the blue line would be a chemical reaction without an enzyme. We see the activation energy here, right? To, we have to put a little bit of energy in. So the amount of energy goes up as we activate it and then comes down so it goes out, right? We have to put in energy. Now, if you notice, if we have enzymes or catalysts that are lowering the activation energy, this red line, it takes a lot less energy to get it started. If you notice the difference between the two right here, right? The difference between the blue and the red lines is that enzyme. That enzyme got rid of all this energy needed to start a reaction. Okay, so enzymes lower the activation energy. They lower the amount of energy required to start a reaction. Um, so when enzymes catalyze or start something, right, the things they start with are called substrates. So a substrate is the substance that a an enzyme brings together and catalyzes or makes a reaction happen, right? A substrate we can kind of think about as the reactants of a chemical reaction, right? That's what you start with. 
So how do enzymes and uh, actually work, right? Um, and they work based on their shape. So it's really important to remember, right, that an enzyme is a catalyst, but especially like in humans, most enzymes are made up of protein, oops, proteins, okay? And we talked about proteins already, right? One of the macromolecules. And hopefully from class, you'll remember that one of the most important things I want you to remember about proteins is that shape, okay, the protein shape determines its function. Okay, so a protein shape determines its function, which means an enzyme's shape determines its function. Okay, so shape determines function. Now, enzymes will only catalyze or do very specific reactions. Remember, there's millions of different enzymes out there, and each one has a very single reaction that it does. All right, and basically the way it works is this little enzyme here, which is made up of proteins, is floating around, has a very specific shape. When it encounters a substrate, all right, or a reactant for a chemical reaction, this substrate fits perfectly right in this little hole called the activation site. All right, and when it fits in there, when an enzyme gets one substrate and another substrate, it puts them together, boom, does the reaction much quicker. All right, and this is also known as the lock and key method, right? You're only going to open this lock for the specific key that opens it. Again, this all comes back to that idea that shape determines function. It's only going to work if it's the exact same shape. And remember, the whole part of an enzyme, right, is that shape determines its function, and the enzyme makes reactions go faster because it lowers the activation energy, okay? And by lowering the activation energy, it makes the reactions happen faster, okay? So the reactions will go faster. And I like to think about this. Think about your iPhone, right? If you have 100 apps on your iPhone, okay, uh, what's going to be faster? To scroll through your screen until you find the exact app and then click on it? Or can you just search for it real quick? Slide up or slide to the right and search uh, Angry Birds, right? And boom, Angry Birds pops up, okay? Enzymes work the same way. Instead of these substrates just floating around randomly trying to find each other and connect, the enzyme finds one, finds the other substrate, boom, right? Just like a search button on your iPhone or iPad. Um, enzymes speed up the reactions by finding the substrates and bringing them together, okay? Um, and finally, right, enzymes can be affected in our bodies in plenty of ways, okay? Um, in some bad ways, right? Enzymes determine are affected greatly by pH and by temperature. Okay, so if the body, the pH of your body changes a little bit, maybe you drink a little bit of bleach by accident, right? You're going to get sick, you're going to start to die because those enzymes are going to change shape, right? And they're going to start to not work. And remember, we said shape determines function. So if your enzyme changes shape, it can no longer function properly. So if you change the pH of your body, that won't work. When you get sick and have a fever, right? Fevers can be really dangerous as they get really high because, again, the enzymes start to change shape, okay, and when they change shape, they don't work. So when you have a fever, your enzymes aren't working, um, and your body can't do metabolism, can't do the processes it needs to do. So pH, temperature can regulate an enzyme in bad ways, like if you get sick. And the other way we control enzymes is by regulatory molecules, all right, regulatory molecules. And the way this works is basically, uh, if you look here at this little picture, right, of an enzyme, this is an enzyme. This is a substrate, which it's going to make a chemical reaction with. Um, and then you see here, right, there's a little site for like a regulatory molecule. Now, a regulatory molecule is basically a chemical that controls a, a, um, the rate of the enzymes and if they're doing chemical reactions. And the best way to think about this is Think about it like a key to a car, right? Um, unless you have the key to a car, you're not going to turn it on. So for an enzyme to work, this regulatory molecule must be here in the enzyme connected, okay? It's like if you're going to go drive your mom's car, you need to have that key to turn the car on. When your body doesn't want to do reactions and it doesn't want to use enzymes, it takes away these regulatory molecules and then the enzymes won't function. So again, it's like a key to a car.
All right, that's the end for this lesson. So I would go back, watch this video once or twice more, review, make sure you know all the key terms and questions. Um, 